we're going to actually continue a series that was unexpectedly launched last week with Pastor David with the letters to the churches in Revelations. Eli, can you take me down just a touch? So Pastor David shared with us last week about the church in Ephesus and the letter of Jesus to the church in Ephesus was really to remind them to remember their first love, to look at how far they had fallen and to get back to where they were. And today what we're going to cover is the church of Smyrna. And this is number two of the seven churches that Jesus had the Apostle John write to. And typically, when we talk about these seven churches, a lot of times you're hearing about the correction. You're like, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be corrected. We know now what not to do. So let's not do that. Let's make sure that we stay on the right path. And so we, we tend to focus on those corrections. Well, interestingly, um, the church of Smyrna didn't get any corrections. And they were one of two churches that had no corrections. Actually, the church of Philadelphia as well had no corrections. Jesus actually commended them and encouraged them to continue in the way that they were. <clears throat> so I really believe that we can obviously learn from other people being corrected, but how much could we learn from the ones that are doing it the way he wants it done? Right. To see the example of, oh, that's what we should be doing. Right. That should be our priority. That should be our focus. Right. That should be what we should be able to do. Right. So in Revelations chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, Jesus said to John, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those, of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when, suffer, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. It was said that in A.D., 155, a man named Polycarp, the famous bishop from Smyrna, was singled out as a leader of the church. Refusing to recant his faith at the age of 86, Polycarp was burned alive at the stake. Before he died, he is reported to have said, Eighty and six years I have served him, Christ, and he hath done me no wrong. How can I speak evil of my king who saved me? And the theme of what I want to share with you guys this morning is really that we should be willing, like the church in Smyrna, to endure any hardship, any suffering, any persecution for our Lord, and then we should not be afraid. Right. And it's all for His glory, and it's for our gain. That's right. And so the title of my message to you guys this morning is, Come What May. Come What May. Let that be our attitude. Right. Come What May. So I'm going to break it down into three parts, basically, this morning is part one is going to be Jesus, the first and the last, if just pulling it straight from that passage. Part two is suffering produces riches. And part three is don't be afraid. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Y'all ready? So Revelation 2.8, it says, write this letter to the angel in the church of Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead but is now alive. Can you imagine that, getting a letter from somebody who introduces themselves like that? First and last. I love how he, how he phrases this. And what's interesting is every letter he introduces himself in a way that John had already been revealed to him in, in the earlier, I think it was in chapter 1. But every way that Jesus introduces himself, it was repeated from the previous chapter. So Jesus actually introduces himself as the first and the last. It wasn't just John saying this about Jesus. Jesus said, no, you're right, John. The way you see me, this is what it is. I am the first and I'm the last. 
And the way uh, I like to see that is he's first and last in authority. He's first in authority and he's last. He has the first word and the final word. Right. And everything in between is subject to his authority. Right. Colossians 1.18 says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Right. First and last in the kingdom of God in the world. Romans 8.29, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to be like his son, Jesus, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And first and last in suffering and latter glory. And I like to see this as he's first in suffering. As in, nobody's going to out-suffer Jesus. He's the first. And he's the last in the greatest way that he can do it and accomplish it and win the victory and, and seal it all up. He, he was like the first one in and the last one out. He led the way, and he was the caboose. Nobody, nobody in this room will outsuffer Jesus. Nobody will feel more pain than he felt. Nobody will feel more hurt. Nobody will feel more loss, more embarrassment, more tragedy, more heartbreak than him. He said, I'm going in first. And then I'm going to come in last right. and, and take them all home. Yes. He started it, and he's going to finish it. Yes. And I was thinking about this. I'm going to be heavy on Scripture this morning, which is a good thing for all of us. Because God's Word goes out, and it doesn't come back void. Right. I, and I immediately had this picture of Noah letting the dove out of the ark. And it went out, and it came back with that olive branch. God's word goes out and it comes back with life. It comes back with something produced. But Jesus is our role model here. And I want to I want to read this passage in Isaiah 53. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's a short chapter, but I want you to get the fullness of what Jesus Christ endured for us. I want you to get the fullness of what him being first really looks like. So Isaiah chapter 53 who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing but beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet it was the Lord who laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal and put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted as righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. That was Jesus, the first. That was our Savior, the Lord. Yes. Amen. 
the Lord. Yes. What a role model. And I was telling my mom earlier, what really I find really impacts my life, what really motivates me and drives me in a sense of leadership is when I can look at somebody who's done something or been somewhere that I haven't been yet. And, and it's inspiring to say that if they can do it, I can do it. If, if they did it, then I must have to do it. You know, if, if they think it's right, then I must think it's right. Like, and, and I might forget a lot of what they tell us, you know, our parents, you know, if let us well, you might forget a lot of what people say, but their example, right. their life leads you so well. Right. It can carry you so far and answer so many questions that you never got a chance to ask. And that's what Jesus' role model is for us. Do you, don't you think that it was tempting for Jesus, who had the keys of life and death in his hands, who spoke all creation into existence, to just say, no thanks. At any moment, he could have stopped it. And, and he could have, but, but he didn't. We must have the same attitude that he had. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Paul says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Like, no, 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 me. I mean, come on. I'm, we're God. I'm not doing this. He didn't cling. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself even more in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like Isaiah? Now I know Paul had Isaiah to reference there, but Isaiah wrote that about Jesus 600 years before Jesus was born. I always like to be reminded of that. When these words are hitting so hard and so on target, that was written 600 years before Christ ever came. Love that. The Bible is very clear that Christ humbled himself and subjected himself to servanthood and suffering. What could possibly make us think that we are any better than that or we should not have that same attitude? If anybody didn't deserve it, it was him. We think, we, we go through hard times and we think, I don't deserve this. What did I do? I'm doing everything. You know, what could, just Jesus did it first. He did it. He humbled himself. He received it. And he's our lasting image, our everlasting example to follow. He knows about suffering. He understands your pain. He walks with us through it. And he encourages us of his reward if we'll just remain faithful. And that's what I want to talk to you all about next, the, the more fun part here. The reward of remaining faithful. Right. Suffering actually produces riches. You want to get rich? Anybody want here want to get rich? I want to be a millionaire. Right? Let God lead you into some suffering and endure it patiently, and you will be rich. Revelations 2.9, I know all about your suffering, he said, and your poverty. And he reminds them, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. It's interesting, you know, Jesus says the same thing to the other church that didn't get corrected. He said, they say they are Jews, but they are not. Their synagogue belongs to Satan. A lot of the persecution that these churches were facing were from Jews, were from religious people who rejected Christ, who saw Christ as an, as an opposition to their agenda. And it's much different. A lot of the persecution that the church faces around the world and will face coming up is organizations, bodies of people that have an agenda, that have a moral authority, and it's in opposition to the Bible. It's in opposition to Jesus and his authority. Remember, 
He has the first word and the last word. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. But in the middle of that, there's a lot of people who have their own agenda, their own set of rules, their own moral authority that they stand on. And when they, when they, come, when they confront an immovable force like the Word of God and Jesus Christ and, and, and you standing in the way, guess what? You're a target. You are in the way of their agenda. They're trying to advance their kingdom, their religion, their way of thinking, their whatever agenda they have. They're pushing their agenda, and they will mow down anybody who gets in their way. And, and I would invite you to use your imagination and think about this. Think about the different movements that have been in this world in history and that's going on today and that will continue to go. These people have an agenda, and if you oppose them, you're, you're their enemy, and they will fight you. Whether they got to use physical force, laws, whatever they got to do, they will, they will destroy you. And so guess what that means for us? Persecution. It's coming. We, we have not experienced much persecution. Pastor David tells us all the time. We have not experienced that much persecution here in America because of our religious freedom and the laws that protect us. But those are going to go away. They are going away so fast. But you know what's interesting is a lot of times you think enemies of Christ, enemies of Christianity, like atheists, that's got to be the worst. Not really. Atheists, for the most part, they don't care what you do. They just don't believe. They're not promoting atheism necessarily. Some of them are. Mostly people that have offense to churches, they grew up in a church or something, and they just want to destroy everybody who ever called themselves a Christian. But for the most part, they're indifferent. That's not really, you're in, that's not really where the persecution is going to come from. And we do live in America in a post-Christian society. There's a lot of atheism in America. But what it's turning into is they have no values, they have no agenda worthy of, of they, you know, I'm going to say it like this. America had uh, a good, holy, God-honoring, people-honoring agenda to spread freedom, to honor the Lord. Um, God bless America. From these shores, the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth. But now we're in the other side of that. We're in a post-Christian society where we pursued pleasure for so long. We abandoned that call of God on our lives and on our nation. But that left a void because there's no purpose. So now we've found other purposes. Right. We've picked up other agendas of activism and things that they're going to push and ram. And guess what? It's not just America. It's global. And there's a global push to enforce an agenda, which we know will just write from the same book that Jesus is writing in the letters, in the book of Revelation. We know that it's all going to come together globally, and that there will be one ruler over that global system, right. the Antichrist. Right. So that's happening. That agenda is in full force, right. but what is standing in the way of that is the church. Right. The church will always be a problem. So when the church starts to become a problem, they're going to start trying to just mow us down, mow us down, mow us down, mow us down. And we're close to that. And if you don't think that, I'm not trying to be insulting, but you're naive. You, you might be cozy in your bubble of pleasure and career and passions and whatever you're pursuing, but you're going to get that knock on your door. You're going to hear the words, you can't shop here. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to enroll in this system. You have to sign this document. You have to take this mark. And we have to have the fortitude that, that says, no, if there's anything, like that man said in the church of Smyrna, 80 and 6 years I have served Christ, and he hath done me no wrong. How can I speak evil of my king who saved me? Come what may. Come what may. Jesus commended these churches for enduring persecution, for enduring suffering. 1 Peter 2.20 says, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. 
But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. He's pleased with that. Now, don't go doing wrong and, and getting the recoil from that. That's on you. <laughs> you're on your own in that case. But if, if you are receiving persecution, if you're receiving suffering, and, and you weren't the, the just poking a bear kind of thing, and you just endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. And those suffering, that suffering will add riches to your life, eternal riches to your life. Jesus said, I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich, he reminds them. Jesus didn't come and just say, hey, I'm on my way. Hang in there one more second. I'm coming to bail you out. I'm going to scoop you up out of there. Don't worry. I'm on my way. No. He didn't say that. He actually told them about more that was coming. He gave them a heads up. They were getting richer by the day spiritually. Why would Christ want to withhold that from them? God's agenda was being promoted through the earth, even now, through their example, through their suffering and enduring it patiently. Why would God want to unplug that and stop that? There was so much happening, so much being produced from that. He didn't say, I'm coming to bail you out. He said, hang in there. You're rich. You're getting richer. My father's pleased with you. Jesus warned his disciples that this suffering and this persecution was coming. Jesus came and established a different kingdom in the world. He set his flag. Bam. He's like, bam. When he set that flag, in the, it was a whole different story now. And he knew whoever comes under this banner, you're going to suffer. Because now you're an enemy of this whole world system. This world that's fading away. This world that's dying. You're going to live. You have eternal life. But when you come under this flag, you better buckle up. Buckle up. But you're going to be blessed. It's going to be worth it. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't worth it. He did it. He was the first. There's two kingdoms that are at war with each other. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, which is passing away. These people were poor in this world's kingdom, but they were rich in God's kingdom. They were weak in this seen kingdom that you could touch. They seemed weak, but they were strong in God's unseen kingdom. They were the least here on earth, but they were the greatest in the kingdom of God. Jesus was reminding the church in Smyrna, you are rich. I just got finished correcting these other five churches. They got it pretty good. You are rich. I know about your suffering. I know about your poverty. But you are rich. I want to give you all a list of the rewards, the prize that's awaiting those who are victorious. In those seven little bitty letters that Jesus wrote to these churches, I pulled out all of the rewards he promises to them if they will remain faithful. Y'all ready for this? Just tell me, give me some feedback. If y'all hear one you like, say, yeah, I want that one. I'll take that one. Like I say, hey, do we have $100? Do we have three? Hey, I'll take the crown of life. Okay, y'all ready for this? Anybody interested in, in here in any riches, a crown of life, fruit from the tree of life, manna stored in heaven, a white stone with a new name on it for you? Clothed in white, names never erased from the book of life. Announced by Jesus before the Father and all the angels that you are his. Walk with Jesus in white. Enemies, your enemies, bow at your feet and acknowledge that you are the one that Jesus loves. Protection from a great time of testing that will come upon the whole world. Become a pillar in the temple of our God. Never have to leave that temple. The name of God himself written on you. Be citizens of the kingdom of God in his new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from God. Amen. Written on you, Jesus' new name. He gets a new name. That will be written on you. Share a meal with Jesus as friends. Sit, get this one, sit on the throne with Jesus just as he was victorious and sat on the throne with his father. That's Revelation 3.21. Sit on a throne with Jesus. Anybody interested? Can I get any takers?
Do we have any takers? But you might have to suffer for it. Is that okay? Just a little bit. A little while. You know, Jesus put so much emphasis on this. You know, the other side of this is Jesus exposed in the seventh church to Laodicea in his correction in Revelation 3.17. He said, you say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You don't have anything from this list. But you dress nice on Sunday mornings. You drive a nice car. You got a nice job. You got a lot of friends. You're real popular. You got it going on. You are rich. You don't need a thing. But you don't realize. You have nothing. You are nothing without me. This is clearly to God through Christ, a very, very important topic that we live for his kingdom in spite of the riches that this world has to offer. Not living for riches in spite of what God has to offer. That's what happens. Those two kingdoms are fighting each other, and you're going to have to pick a side. You're either going to get mowed down or you're going to get left behind. You, you don't want to, to cling to this life, to hold on to what this life has to offer and let all those riches pass you by. Right. Jesus, I, I'd love to hear the research on it, but I think he covered that topic in general more than any other topic. In all the Gospels, in, in the letters, everywhere, <clears throat> he talked about putting the kingdom of God first. Right which is unseen and lived in by faith, over the temporary satisfaction that this world has to offer, even if it means suffering, losing, or giving away. He always promised that if we would, we would be storing up treasures in heaven. We'd be getting rich in heaven. When it comes to suffering, we're only called to endure it patiently. That's it. And you know what? You're not even being asked to go look for it and, and get some of it. Just when it comes, just endure it. That's it. Don't go walk in front of a train <laughs> suffering for Jesus. There's no need for that. Just live for God. Do all the things that he's told us to do. And then when that opposition comes, you pass across with the kingdoms of this world, and they're like, oh, no, you will not stop me from believing what I want to believe. Oh, no, you will not oppose what I'm saying. Oh, no, you will abide. Oh, no, you will comply. Well, come what may. Do what you got to do. I'm rich. I'm set. My 401k is in heaven. I'm good. I'm not subject to any market fluctuations. Wouldn't that be a great feeling if you had a 401k that was just like rock solid? It didn't matter what the Dow was doing or what they were doing or it's like that for us in heaven. Right. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> in Luke 17, 33, Jesus said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. Let it go for his sake. Right. When push comes to shove, and his sake means letting your life go, let it go. Because you're going to find it. You're going to get your life in him. So part three is I... Start to round this out. Don't be afraid. Right. Don't be afraid. That's right. Based on everything that we just talked about, don't be afraid. Right. Know where your treasure is. In Revelation 2.10, Jesus said, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Remember, this is coming from the one who suffered more than anybody. I've been there. I just came out of that. Don't be afraid. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. That sounds familiar, huh? Oh, he just serves you because you bless him all the time. Let me take something from him, and then he'll curse you to your face. You think Job's the only one that ever gets that treatment? Because when we're tested, the glory shines. When you're tested 
and the world sees he's not just raising his hands because the music's perfect. He's not just shouting for joy because his bank account's full because he's getting walloped. But some reason, he's just praising the Lord. There's something else there. There's something eternal inside that's being put on display through suffering. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. I have to imagine that suffering was really intense for him to let them know how long it was going to be. To help them get through it. Which reminds us that Jesus understands. He knows how hard it is to suffer. He knows how hard it is to face temptation. He knows how hard it is to be consistent and faithful in the face of opposition. And he's with you. He, he reminds you that I'm with you. He can even look 10 days in, ahead and let you know there's a 10-day, just brace yourself. But we're in this together. And I've been through the worst of it. Don't be afraid. Come on. Like we were walking the girls down the aisle last night at Hannah's wedding. It was so nice walking my wife down the aisle. I felt so proud. Ten years later, we make ten years this month, actually. And we got married right here in this room. I walked Rachel right down this aisle that you're sitting at right now. May 25th, 2013. Yeah. So, if you remain faithful, I will give you the crown of life. I'm not afraid of a crown of life. I'm not afraid of the prize. So if I can keep my eyes on that prize, I won't be afraid. If Peter would have kept his eyes on Jesus, he wouldn't have been afraid. But when you start looking at the wind and the waves, oh, yeah. Don't focus on the suffering. Don't focus on the wind and the waves. Focus on the prize. You think those people, Jesus had to tell them these things so that they could just get through those 10 days because there was a prize waiting on the other side. It's tempting to be afraid of suffering, but not to be afraid of a prize. And get this, Jesus said that you will get back 100 times whatever you sacrifice. In Matthew 19, 29, everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. I don't know about y'all, but the eternal life would be good enough. But then I get all the other stuff back times a hundred? Of course. Wait till you get to my kingdom. A hundred is nothing. <laughs> you know, in Solomon's day, there was so much wealth in his kingdom that silver was worthless. Everything was in gold. The walls, everything, floors, gold. In heaven, the streets are made out of gold. A hundred times, yes. Reality. Bank on it. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a wishful thinking. It's fact. That's right. Imagine what the people of Smyrna and the church there had stored up a hundred times. But it's only a hundred times of what you lose. It's only a hundred times of what you sacrifice. It'd be great if we didn't sacrifice anything here and get a hundred times of something that, of something. A hundred times of something I didn't sacrifice. But it doesn't quite work like that. No wonder Jesus said they were rich. Our sacrifice and suffering is never in vain. I want you all to hear that. It's never overlooked. It's never ignored. It's all heading up and producing spiritual riches in others and for ourselves. You're not only storing up riches for yourself. You're helping somebody else store up riches. And I don't know about you all. Maybe you all felt like this for all of our working people here, you ever felt just like your boss never appreciated what you were doing, the output that you were just trying to get out there, just trying to, and you just felt underappreciated, overlooked? Anybody ever felt like that? 
You don't have to, you don't have to worry about that with this. This is totally different. Jesus sees everything. And he's keeping a real good count on what's coming back to you times 100. Very good count. He's counting things you're not counting on. He sees sacrifices and remembers sacrifices that you don't remember. Remember when you bought that guy lunch that day? Yep. Whoa. You remember that? You're compensating me for that? That was nothing. It was to me. Jesus saw that woman drop those two coins in that collection offering. Nobody else did. It was so little. Nobody was paying attention to her. She was the least of the least. And Jesus let them all know. You see all these other people, all these rich people coming in and dumping their buckets in, and they love the way it sounds when it hits the bottom, and they want to make sure everybody knows what they gave, and they're so rich. They're so, such a blessing to the kingdom as if God needs their money. Nobody needs your money. Let me just put that out there. If you have a problem with giving your money and the buckets and all that, don't give it. God doesn't need your money. We're talking about streets of gold. But what he wants is that those two copper coins, the heart and the faith that drops those two copper coins in there that nobody knows about. And Jesus said she gave more than everybody else here because she gave everything that she had. Sacrifice. The devil wants to convince us that it's all for nothing and you'll get nothing in return and no one is looking out for you, so you have to look out for yourself and your family. Pastor doesn't care about you. Your boss doesn't care about you. The government surely doesn't care about you. Cheat on your taxes. Don't give in church. Don't be generous. Don't, and that's money stuff, but time, energy. You've got to save your time for you. They don't care about your time. They're trying to use up all your time, whatever you give them. They're trying to take, 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 take. But that's a lie. We're serving the king. Does the king take, 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 take? Not our king. He gives, 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 gives. He gave first, and he gives last. God emptied heaven out when he sent his son to die on that cross. There wasn't anything more valuable left to give. In a sense, God, Jesus, beat the widow who gave those two copper coins. She gave more than everybody there at that time, but Jesus gave more than that. A giver knows a giver. And Jesus knows the givers. He knows those who are sacrificing. He sacrificed. And he didn't hold anything back. Jesus said, seek seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. It's not all suffering. I want to to remind you all of that. It's not all suffering. We do get to enjoy his incredible, incredible blessings. I'm enjoying a life and a blessed life that I could have never dreamed of without Christ. Right here on this earth. Just like I talked about my bride walking down this aisle. I am so blessed. It doesn't get any better than this, honestly. But the end game is so much bigger. It's so much greater than brides and money and houses and jobs and careers and retirements and fishing and whatever else. It's so much bigger and greater than that. This is a battle of eternity. We are soldiers in the Lord's army. We aren't just peasants looking for a blessing. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Running, running, running. Where's my blessing? Who can pray for me? I need this. I want that. Give me, give me, give me. We're soldiers. We're called to war in the kingdom of God for the souls of men. We have purpose in our suffering. There's purpose in it. I have to remind you of that. There was purpose in the church's suffering in Smyrna. It wasn't just because. It even wasn't just because you happen to live in a fallen world. Because God could protect us in a fallen world. But he purposefully lets some of that through for a purpose. A really good purpose. Come what may. Can I hear all y'all say that? Come what may. One more time. Come what may. Come what may. That's okay. Come what may. I should have titled it that. 
And as I close, Eli, you can play a little something. Or Ray, if you want to come. Let, let Ray come up. I should have told you that ahead of time. But as Jesus, is, closes his, as Jesus closes his letter, he says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. You know he finished all of his letters by saying, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Does anybody in here have ears to hear? Even if you don't have ears to hear, you have other methods of getting messages. If you're breathing, more than likely. So he wants us to get the message. He doesn't want the message just to be in the room with you. He wants the message to touch your heart. He gave you ears to hear so that his word could get to your heart. But if if we let it, it can just get to here and then just go right back out. But we want that word to come in and go into our heart. Again, eternal life, that's the prize by itself. The second death is eternal separation from God in hell. There's a place that God made to store up everything that's separated from him forever. Separated from his holiness. Separated from his life. In John 3.16, we all know it. But God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He wants everybody with ears to hear to hear that message. He's not exclusive. If he was exclusive, we wouldn't be in the room. You would have never got the memo. But you got the memo. You got it 800 different ways, maybe, some of you. You got it over and over and over and over until it finally, you finally came to your senses. He wants you so bad in his home, in his family. And there's only one way, like he said, anyone who is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. There's only one way to be victorious over sin, and that's through this cross. In John 14, 6, Jesus told them, told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me, through Jesus. And his invitation is wide open. And he wants everybody that has ears to know about it. But then once we receive that invitation, come what may. Come what may. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me this morning. If you're in here this morning and the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart, His Word, like I mentioned, went out, it's not going to come back void. It's going to come back with fruit. You just want to be the fruit. You don't want to come back and that Word was pulling on your heart and the Holy Spirit was pulling on your heart because you knew that I am not victorious because I'm not truly in Christ. But I want to be in Christ. I want to receive and inherit eternal life. I want to have that list of riches waiting for me. I want to have the assurance that promise is waiting for me. If that's you this morning, I'd like to invite you to come Join me in the front here. I would like to pray with you so that you can receive the joy of God's eternal life for you. In Jesus' name. Come on up here if that's you. If you would like to make Jesus Christ.